unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope and life and death. Let's listen as we hear this next verse. To the grave, what shall we sing? Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life. There we will rise, there we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our home springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our home. sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and ever we confess christ our hope and life and death now and ever we confess christ our hope and life and death Christ. He is our hope. He is our hope in life for this life, but also the life to come. We're going to take a moment and sing this song, No Longer Slaves. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of fear, a lot of things going around our world with what's happening in the news. But we understand because we're children of God, we're no longer a slave to fear. Because we are children of his, we don't have to fear. We know that God is control of everything. So let's go ahead and uh, sing. Listen as we sing this song, I should say, uh, No Longer Slaves. Good evening, Faith Baptist Church. So glad you're here tonight. Join us virtually. I'm so glad that you could be a part of this. And so it's our live event here with Dr. Branch as we continue Sanctity of Life Month. And I trust you've been encouraged and challenged by what you've heard. I trust you've been able to share it with somebody as well and see them encouraged about it or also challenged. Or maybe it's a new subject entirely. Or maybe they're needing to heal because of the subject matter. 
in whatever way, I hope it's been a help to you. And we continue this weekend with our special guest, uh, Dr. Branch, and his wife, Lisa, who's a professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, has been a pastor, interim pastor. I mean, you've got a lot of titles there, right, Dr. Branch? And so I want to say thank you to them for traveling up. And we're going to have a quick question and answer. And before we do, I want you to be thinking already maybe a question you have about sanctity of life. One of our main topics we're going to be talking about tonight, tonight is how we got to where we're at in our country with regarding abortion, with all the legalities and whatnot. And so if you have some questions either about sanctity of life, about court cases regarding abortion or whatnot, uh, send them in uh, via Facebook or you can text us. We'll try to answer those on air here with Dr. Branch as well. So before we get started with our questions, uh, Dr. Branch, just let me give a quick, uh, a quick bio, a quick intro about yourself. Well, I'm so glad to be here. My name is Alan Branch. I've been teaching at Midwestern Seminary for 20 years. I'm originally from Georgia. My wife and I have been married for 32 years. We have two daughters, and uh, we're proud of both of them. They're both living for the Lord, and uh, for that, we're very proud. Uh, I have uh, written a couple of books addressing LGBTQ issues. I've done an enormous amount of research on sanctity of life issues. Our school is committed to the sanctity of human life. Our statement of faith says we believe in the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. I embrace that statement of faith, and it's a great joy to try to articulate that. I really believe we have a positive message and an encouraging message. Paul, I was thinking about a story uh, as we were starting here, and just this morning, Lisa and I were, were discussing this. We have an acquaintance, a friend from years back, and when she was a teenager, beautiful young woman, uh, she got pregnant. And we, we uh, she was closer to Lisa than to me, but was a good friend to her. And her father was insistent that she was not going to be an out of wedlock pregnancy, and he forced her to get an abortion as a 16, 17 year old girl. And her life has been a real series of ups and downs. And this morning we were reflecting on our friend's life, and this is someone we care about. We're not putting her down. That's that's not the point. But we were just reflecting on her life and all the turns and twists that it's taken. And, and Lisa said something. She said, I, I wonder how much of this goes back to her dad's insistence that, that she get an abortion. And we care about her. We want the best for her. And we're still hoping God's going to do good things in these latter days in her life. Uh, and I think that's, as we start this, I want everyone to know that if, there, if the data is anywhere correct, 62.5 million abortions since 1973, so someone that's listening to us has uh, a post-abortive mother, a post-abortive father. They have a child that uh, has had an abortion, a grandchild. And what, what I want everyone to hear is that we offer grace. And the way I look at it is we're standing at the top of the cliff called an abortion, and we're trying very hard to plead with people not to go over the cliff. But at the bottom of the cliff, uh, we have the ambulance full of grace. And, and we want people to know there's grace in the name of Jesus Christ and there's hope. But we do need to talk about why we as Christians believe in the sanctity of human life. Right. And I'm so glad you start off with that tone, if we could use that way, right. because we talked uh, with some ladies from the Miami Valley Women's Center yes. in our area. A pro-life advocacy center helps ladies understand about uh, the pregnancy, helps uh, boyfriends, husbands the same way. And that's what we wanted to say is, you know, sometimes we're so passionate about the subject, and rightfully so, uh, that sometimes it can come across as if we're against people. And that's not right. the case. We're no. pro-life. <laughs> we're exactly. pro-life pro for sure. And so as we kind of start off the interview talking about it, uh, I want to start with this question. Uh, when, why do Christians believe life begins at conception? Why do we, and what difference does it make? Well, there's biblical reasons, and then there's really what we would call practical or philosophical reasons. So let's talk biblically. Biblically, in Psalm 51, David's psalm of repentance, we don't often think of this psalm in reference to the sanctity of life issue, but it's very, very interesting. David's committed this sin with Bathsheba, and he's confessing that sin to the Lord. But if you remember, he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. He's, and what he's saying is, I was born with a sinful nature at conception. As, as Christians, and we think about our theology, that's a very profound statement. That tells us that a fundamental aspect of human nature which is a sin nature David's saying I had that at conception mm -hmm. so it's, it's applying personhood to him as Christians as well the idea of the human life starting at conception uh, goes to the birth of Jesus and our doctrine about him being our Messiah and our Savior 
John 1, 13 says the word became flesh. And we know the word there is referring to Christ. John 1, 1, the word was God. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh. And we call this the incarnation. Your church knows about that. Well, the question is, when did the incarnation begin? Well, there were some heretical groups throughout church history that said things like, oh, well, the incarnation began and his baptism, he got adopted, or some even suggested when he's in the temple, he realized he was the Messiah or something like that. But all that's wrong. If you read the Bible, it's very clear. When Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, she's only maybe four weeks gestation, and Elizabeth says to her, you are the mother of my Lord. She's already applying personhood to Jesus in the womb. Uh, it, it's very profound that the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began at conception. The Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and, and created with, within her womb the Messiah. And so if Jesus shared in all of our humanity, and he did, and if he was a person at conception, and he was, then that speaks to the personhood of all other humans. I want to get, so th from, from a theological standpoint, as a Christian who believes the Bible, that's the biblical reason. Now let me get the practical reason. The practical reason is you take a one-celled zygote after conception and you examine the DNA. What's it going to tell you? It's going to tell you it's human. It's not a dog. It's not a gorilla, not a chimpanzee. It's not something else. It's human. And sometimes I've heard people say, well, you look at the, the embryo in the early weeks of gestation. It doesn't look human. My answer, no, it, it, it looks exactly what humans look like at that stage. Exactly. None of us skip that stage. And speaking as a former zygote, I'm con very concerned about what we, we do with these things. Um, every now and then, let me just address something some of your church folks may have heard about. Sometimes people will say, well, you don't really know if it's personhood till after twinning because it, up into a couple of weeks in gestation, you still possibly have twins occur. And so you don't really know if it's one person. Well, no, the question then is not whether or not it's a person. You know, it's a human. The question is, do you have one or two? That's right. It hasn't changed personhood. It's just right. how many people. <laughs> right, exactly. So those are the biblical and theological reasons we believe human life begins at conception. Right. And I think, again, the, the wording is so important here. Personhood. Yeah. Personhood. Because when that gets altered, that's where we really begin the, the downward slope, right? It is. And if I could speak to that, the, the key idea that our secular neighbors advocate uh, or use to advocate for abortion is what we call developmental personhood. So this is the idea. From their perspective, personhood and life are two separate things. Christians use them as synonyms. I do. I believe that's right. But our secular neighbors will we'll separate those ideas and just because something is human life doesn't mean that it has personhood and so they'll say personhood is something you develop into and once you're able to communicate you're sentient you can kind of start making your own life decisions then you develop into personhood but on the other end of the spectrum which we'll talk about tomorrow night with end of life issues on the other end of the spectrum they'll say that you can actually lose personhood as you get older so it's called developmental personhood one kind of weaves in and out of personhood and that's a very dangerous way to treat people and a way to treat human beings. Uh, honestly, if they're going to use that sort of argument for a preborn child in the womb, there's not really much difference between a preborn child and a child that's one in two days old. Um, so developmental personhood is a dangerous idea. Christians, however, we believe that personhood applies to all human life, and we recognize that that we grow and we, we mature and we are able to exercise more of the abilities of being a human, but that doesn't change the fact that that's in fact what we are, and we treat human life differently than we do other types of life. Yeah, the fundamental essence is still there, that's personhood. Right. Yeah, that's right. No matter what stage, personhood. I agree. So, so with that, that said, give us a bit of maybe the historical or, or legal background, right. how we got to where we're at, because I think many Christians watching right now or those who Come would on. be watching later on maybe, um, I think those who are pro-life are certainly, yes, I am pro-life. And if we said, tell us how we got where we're at legally and how that changed, I think many of us would say, <laughs> so how did that start to morph in our country where we go from conception personhood to whether that's it? Well, that's a long story. Uh, abortion, the history of abortion laws in the United States are very interesting. The first state to actually have a law against abortion is Connecticut in 1821. And very soon after, in the next 40 years or so, the AMA uh, began to organize the American Medical Association. And early on, the American Medical Association said, no, we're not for abortion. And you have to remember that all these things are just forming that country. It's still a baby at that time. 
But by the, by 1900, all the states in the Union had laws saying we don't do abortion, unless it's in the case uh, to save a mother's life, and then danger of a mother's life. Can I just say a little about that real quick before we move on? Absolutely. Uh, some of your church members, I'm sure, uh, have encountered a friend, and maybe they've experienced themselves as part of an ectopic pregnancy. And this is where it's a very tragic circumstance where the baby implants in the wrong place, typically the fallopian tube. And this is a tragic circumstance, and let me be clear, an ectopic pregnancy is not going to come to turn. It's a medical emergency, and if, if nothing is done, it's going to rupture and the mother can bleed out and die. It's, it's a very, very dangerous thing. You can't save both lives in an ectopic pregnancy. You can save one. You can save the life of a mother. And, and Baptists in particular have always affirmed that uh, an ectopic pregnancy is a tragic circumstance where the baby's not going to come to term. We have to do what we can to save the mother's life. So Baptist and, and conservative-minded uh, people across the spectrum who would agree with us throughout the history of the nation have always said, no, we understand that. But I want everyone to understand about 93% of the abortions that occur in the United States every year are not a crisis pregnancy at any That's level. Right. Yeah. They're not rape. They're not incest. They're not an a, a ectopic pregnancy or something like that. They're, they're just, this child is in the way, and we want to get rid of the child. And would elective be the right term? That elective is the, right. They're not about 93% on any given year. And you'd understand that data goes up and down from year to year, but that, that's typically where the number lands, somewhere around that. And that's being generous, honestly. Um, where we, how we got here, let me try to put it this way. Let me start first with the sexual revolution, if I could. The sexual revolution had its first phases in the late 40s, early 50s, when a guy named Alfred Kinsey released a couple of studies on uh, in human sexuality, taught at the University of Indiana, and he was, uh, he was not a nice person. Uh, Alfred Kinsey was, in my opinion, a very bad person. But he published these books that got tons of play out in the press, and they were the opening salvo of the sexual revolution. Steam picks up, the OCP comes on the market, uh, or contraceptive pill, in 1960, and this accelerates. I don't think it caused the sexual revolution, but it was an accelerant. And then you had the Summer of Love in 1967 out in uh, San Francisco. 100,000 people descend on San Francisco and uh, just sexual immorality, the, the grossest uh, kind imaginable. And then they move out from there almost as sexual missionaries of liberation around the country. I, I know that's a bit of an oversimplification, but there was this massive shift in sexual ethics. So you have the sexual revolution in the 60s, and then you have Roe v. Wade in 73. And that's not a coincidence because abortion is a brutal coping mechanism for failed contraception. All contraceptive measures, even the best ones, will eventually fail at some point. And when they do, and if you're having sex and the point is we don't want to have babies, then the next step is we're going to do it. Now, legally, in the middle of all that, there was a case that occurred in 1965 that was not related to abortion that came out of Connecticut. It's called Planned Parenthood. Excuse me, Griswold versus Connecticut, and Estelle Griswold was the head of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut. And the state of Connecticut had this law that said uh, you shouldn't sell contraceptives. It was, uh, pro law was probably not well written, but Planned Parenthood jumped on it pretty quickly. And I will tell you, church family, when you start looking at these cases about abortion, uh, it's, it's like that line from the movie Casablanca, let's go round up the usual suspects, and that usually in, in, involves Planned Parenthood at some point. They are the largest abortion provider in the United States and have been for some time. But nonetheless, Estelle Griswold takes uh, the state of Connecticut to court. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965. The United States Supreme Court carved out what's called a right to privacy. The case had nothing to do with abortion and, and addressing abortion, but addressing the sale of contraceptives. But the Supreme Court carved out this constitutional right to privacy. The phrase right to privacy is not in the Constitution anyway. But they carved it out. And there's this whole debate about, even to this day, in the constitutional scholars about whether or not there is really a right to privacy. Uh, uh, Justice Thomas does, just to tell you, doesn't think there is. But nonetheless, that case gave the legal precedent for Roe v. Wade in 1973. That was that domino one, domino one. That is exactly what it really is. And, and you have to remember that the sexual revolution is occurring at the same time, so the foot is under accelerator to burden on his rights. And you had this really... Uh, the Supreme Court that was had the, the bit in their teeth, if you will, to, 
to try to push a left-wing agenda on the country. So this, uh, this notion of right to privacy that was carved out in 1965 gets used by the court in 1973, a case originating out of Texas, Roe v. Wade. And I'll just tell you this, uh, Roe, Jane Roe, Norma McCorvey, she's dead now. She later on in her, she's the young lady that, that was used by abortion law lawyers to um, uh, file a case. Texas had a law that said you couldn't have an abortion unless the mother's life was in imminent danger or something like that. And uh, they used Norma McCorvey. She is the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. They uh, filed it for her under her pseudonym. It's interesting. Uh, Linda Coffey and Sarah Ragel Weddington, the two lawyers who filed this case, Sarah Ragel Weddington was the daughter of a Methodist preacher, and Linda Coffey was a member of Travis Avenue Baptist Church in Fort Worth. She was a, a attending member of a Southern Baptist Church that filed this case. It's disturbing. But... Uh, Nonetheless, they, they did, and the Supreme Court ruled, based on the right to privacy, that abortion had to be legal in all 50 states. Up until about six years before. Bolton originating out of Georgia is the evil twin sister of Roe. So there are two cases on that day, Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton. And Doe clarifies and expands Roe. When you take the two together, what they give you is basically abortion on demand up through nine months of pregnancy. That's really what they, they give you. But I was going to, I mentioned um, Norma McCorby, the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. She became born again. She was born again Catholic uh, and very pro-life. Uh, later in her life and was she insisted that she had been used by these abortion lawyers the child in question in Roe v. Wade was actually born was not aborted so there's a lot of interesting turns and twists those cases Roe v. Bo uh, Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton those twin evil twin sisters on the same day in January 1973 opened the door for abortion on demand throughout the United States which led to several changes up through the 80s and 90s, culminating in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. But um, are, are you aware of much of what was going on in the 70s or 80s with abortion in the United States? Do you know kind of what was going on then? Or? Only from, some, from our class. But oh. <laughs> oh, it was wild. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the church, a uh, true story. I heard her telling her friend all about this, our mutual friend. She got to school. Somebody, I don't know who, drove her down to Atlanta. She had a surgical abortion. She got back on the bus that afternoon, and she's sitting next to Lynn on the ride home, and I hear her telling my friend all about having the abortion, and her mother never knew. She's 15 years old, had an abortion. Her mother, I'm telling you, it happened. I saw it. And so abortion laws were, were so non-restrictive, it became insane. Well, right-thinking people in many uh, more of the more conservative states in the Union said, we've got to rein this in somehow. That all culminated in a case in 1992 after 12 years of Reagan-Bush appointees to the Supreme Court called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So the basic uh, decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey was that the core holding of Roe was sustained, but they shifted abortion rights from a debated right to privacy, I'll just tell you, even liberals will tell you that Roe v. Wade is a very poorly argued case. In fact, it was so poorly argued, there were liberals who wanted abortion rights that were afraid it was going to get overturned. And uh, Justice Kennedy was a swing vote. We now know he was originally going to vote to overturn Roe, and he changed his vote at the last minute and switched. So we were one vote away. It's a five to four decision. Um, and then they shifted abortion rights from debated right to privacy to the more explicit liberty interests in the 14th Amendment. And in doing so, they articulated this wild 
bizarre notion of autonomy. It is so expansive. Planned Parenthood versus Casey basically became the precedent for your laws uh, that give you gay marriage today. I'm, I'm jumping. If there's any legal scholars listening, I know their their head hurts right now, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm, summar I'm, I'm summarizing for the sake of discussion. And uh, my notes will be available to everyone where I detail all the, the jumps. The point being, the court did allow in Casey that if states wanted to, each individual state wanted to, they could do ha things like having waiting periods, and they could do things like parental consent. And as the Supreme Court has, there's been this struggle over the conservative versus progressive voice on the Supreme Court. Basically, in the 29 years since Casey, the court has gradually allowed states, if they so desire, to implement more and more restrictions on abortion. That's why, as we were discussing right before we came in here in Ohio, you have very conservative abortion laws, as in our state where we live, Missouri does as well. But in a state like California, it's anything. You could, I'm still convinced you can have children getting abortions without their parent knowing in California. And then you had this horrible law in, in New York that was, I guess, just a year ago, where these viable babies all the way up to nine months and these people are applauding passing this law. I mean, what a seared conscience. But that's why abortion law varies. A conservative state with a pro-life voice like Ohio or Missouri or Kansas has very different abortion laws than California or New York. And that's kind of how we got to where we're at. Right, and again, if you're watching, it's so helpful to understand how these dominoes got set up and then how they begin to fall because it'll give you understanding from maybe states even some of our friends who are watching that have been in air force why some states are so dramatically different and why governor o dewine with the heartbeat bill that was a real win for the pro-life it, situation it really was and if i could just summarize again if you want to keep it in your mind think this revolution sexual revolution right to privacy 1965 Griswold, connecticut Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, 73, and then radical moral autonomy in 92 with Casey. Now, where we're at today, if I could say a word about the method of abortion today, most of our church folks, when we think of abortion, we think of a surgical abortion, which is basically a suction abortion. It's a violent act, and the baby is sucked to pieces into it. The stories you've heard about baby parts going into a jar are true. That's, right. that's not made up. Right. It, I think that's important. We pause and remind people that. Yeah. I don't think we like to, any no. American, recognize whether you're identifying in your worldview as a Christian or not. I don't think anybody likes the idea of that. No. Well, certainly a Christian we're appalled by, but I don't even think when I talk to people who are not followers of Jesus, I think they think, well, those are only like in weird, rare cases. No. But that hasn't been the history, though. No. That's right. It, and it is a violent act. But there is a shift. It's, uh, it's called the abortion pill. It goes under the name Mifeprex. Mifeprex. It's not a morning after pill. It sometimes gets called that, but it's not. It's, it's designed for an abortion. And originally, it was only legal up through seven weeks of gestation. But during the Obama administration, it was extended up to 10 weeks for gestation. And even though surgical abortions are still the majority of abortions taking place in the United States, there is a real shift. And you can see more and more of these abortions that occur are what we might call RX, pharmaceutical abortions where the, they're using the abortion pill. If your church family has seen this really good pro-life film that was released a couple of years ago called Unplanned, I don't know if anyone saw it. It was really wonderfully done. That pill, is it, it just depicts both forms, both a surgical abortion and a pharmaceutical abortion. So I think folks do need to be aware that there is a shift. But still, the majority are surgical, but there's a shift to more of these pharmaceutical abortions where people take the abortion pill. Right. And so having said that, uh, we discussed it just briefly last week with our guests with uh, Jenny and with uh, Tawan about because there's more a pharmaceutical approach, the numbers won't be accurate necessarily anymore because with there being many states that have, you know, it can go be on demand right to your door and no oversight, how are you going to track the amount of abortions in American culture where it's no longer an appointment, it's through the mail, you opened it up. No, I think that's a good point. I, I have questions about that myself, and I, it varies uh, state to state on how these things are counted. Some states do a better job of tracking some, such information. Others don't do so well. This is going to sound odd. If the best data on how many abortions are being performed every year comes from the Allen Guttmacher Institute, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood. And they seem to be... Um, 
quite proud of documenting how many abortions there are. They actually give you better numbers than the Centers for Disease Control. And their numbers always come out higher than the Centers for Disease Control. So if I know it sounds odd, a pro-life guy telling you if you want the best data, but go to Alan Guttmacher Institute. Yeah, if you just Google that, you can find that. And, and be prepared, though, because as Dr. Branch said, it's, it's very much a this is a good thing, and so the, right. the, the info will be presented in a positive light, right. but it'll break your heart, and, but they do the diligence and the research to try to track uh, efficient uh, in an efficient way of But you numbers. brought up a really good point. I, I, your guest last week, I think, hit on something because the Guttmacher Institute gets their data from, oh, what is it, something like eighteen or 1,600 abortion providers. The number of abortion providers in the nation has dropped pretty precipitously in recent decades, but... They're getting their numbers directly from these abortion providers. But the question is, if people are getting these pills through the mail, how are you even tracking that? I mean, it, it just, we don't know. Right. Less, there's less abortion facilities, but there's going to be less surgical abortions and appointments, and therefore it could be almost a false positive for us yeah. as pro-life individuals saying, look, we're making progress, but it's actually, no, I would say the epidemic's probably worse could and be. unknown, sure. maybe. I think unknown's the right word. Right. Right. So... What's on the horizon on this issue? We've talked a little bit about it, right. that what's on the horizon is pharmaceutical abortions. Have you seen or read anything recently in legislation? Because like when I lived in California, there was always things trying right. to crest up that would never quite make it. And uh, have you seen anything on the horizon that you're like, hey, we need to be aware of this? Or if you ever move out of a, a very conservative state like in Ohio or right. Missouri or whatnot, you need to be aware this might be on the docket. Well, as far as legislation in specific states, I, I don't have that best information for you. But here's what I know is we are always one or two Supreme Court justices away from a, a whole different approach to abortion. And that's one of the great challenges that, um, that we face in our country. I, I believe in our republic. And I know the last few months have been times of tumultuous debate. None of us are happy with ha what happened on the Wednesday a week ago at the Capitol. That doesn't reflect the heart of Christians. Uh, those those uh, bad people, I hope they all get caught and I hope they get prosecuted to the full extent of the law because this is an attack on the republic. And what we have to stand for is you're in, you're in the, this is a long game. This is a long obedience in the same direction is what we need to approach. And I would say if you talk, if you look at the data about what people think about uh, abortion, it's interesting that even very secular kids We'll talk about it not being fair. They have this sense they know it's not fair, that they're, they're not dumb, and they look around the room and they realize, they start looking at the data and they realize, uh, man, there's, there's a lot of kids not in the classroom with me at my high school because they were aborted. So they're aware of this, and I can't stress enough that the data indicates that the pro-life message is annoying to our secular friends because it doesn't go away. And I would just urge a long obedience in the same direction, that we consistently say the same things, and we keep trying to teach the next generation. And we actually have a very affirming message. The message is that you're not an accident. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139. God created you for a purpose. And we don't want you to be aborted. We want you to live. And we want you to have the abundant life that Christ offers. And there's hope and peace available for you. Um, you. You don't have to have your value based on how you look or how you perform or what other people say about you. There's an infinite worth that attaches to you because you are made in the image of God. And that's a very, very affirming message. Especially, and uh, maybe every generation is, has felt this, but I've, I've just watched my generation and the one beneath me and then the one beneath me, so I'm 37, right. in the 20s, and watching our teens, and maybe this is just perception and anachronistic thinking, but it seems like if there's a generation and subsequent generations just adrift searching for identity, anything to cling to, yes. it feels like it's our generation and below, but maybe that's always been the case. Well, uh, if you look, some of the things that are being raised today remind me very much of these people on this quest for something in 1967. Culture kind of goes through these cycles. And I would urge Christians consistently state the positive message. Don't, our primary message is not negative. Our primary message is positive. Whoever you are, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you for a purpose. And God has a purpose for every child. 
And we know that some children have birth defects that are, are more challenging and more difficult. But I'm reminded in uh, Isaiah, Exodus chapter 4, Moses starts making the excuse to God, I, I don't want to go do this. I don't want to go. <laughs> God, I know I want my people out of Egypt, but I don't want to do it. And he starts saying, well, you know, I, by the way, I'm not a good speaker. And God says, you know, who formed a man's mouth? Who made him? And he's talking about birth defects. And basically he says God gets glory out of that. If you're the person with a birth defect, it can be exhausting in days. I mean, it, you get weary on like God. But God has a purpose. God get, gets glorified through those things. And so we have a very positive message that every child is of worth. I have a friend named Steve Freeman. He's an evangelist. And he's a, one of my dearest friends in the world. My wife and I support his ministry, and we love Steve. Steve has cerebral palsy. And his upper torso looks great. His lower torso not so well. And I guess Steve is maybe four foot eight, maybe. He's a gifted pianist and a very good preacher. Um, you know, he grew up with people making all sorts of judgments and value judgments about him because of his cerebral palsy. But he had a mother and father very deeply devoted to Jesus Christ, and they stressed to him, God's got a purpose for your life. God's going to use you. God's going to glorify himself. And he has. Um, he, he's a wonderful preacher and a great And, boy, he's, he does a lot of sanctity of life preaching this month, every year. Every January, he's always really busy. But uh, I think there's something we can all learn from my friend Steve Freeman's life, that regardless of the disabilities or challenges that you face in life, God's got a purpose for you. And, and God can glorify himself through you. Remember, remember John chapter 9, the, the apostles asked Jesus this very bad question. They say, the guy's born blind. I was just thinking that in my mind right now. I was like, man, you're just thinking right there about yeah. this fellow with an infirmity. And they're bad questions. There's so much bad theology in the question, right? Who sinned? His father? Him or his father? His, somebody had to sin here. It's a binary choice, Jesus. Right, right, Give right, us one. Right. And he said, well, neither. But this is so the works of God might be glorified in him. Uh, and I think there's a lot for us to be said about that, that uh, birth defects are a challenge, but God gets glory out of those as well. So we have a positive message. And again, I want to, I want to challenge the church to a long obedience in the same direction. And I think what we need to say is if, we, if there's as many abortions as people say, there's a lot of hurting people out there. And, and they're grieving and they're hurting. And the quiet moments when they're all alone, uh, they grieve. Well, that's what Jesus came for. Jesus came for hurting broken people that have made a mess of their lives. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible, can I tell you this story real quick? Yes, sir. It's um, um, Annie Chambers was one of the most famous people in the history of Kansas City. My seminary is in Kansas City, Missouri. So Annie Chambers was one of the most famous people in the history of Kansas City. And let me tell you why. She was the most famous madam in the history of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. She had a brothel in Kansas City that was famous around the United States. People would come there to go to that brothel. And, you know, it was technically illegal, but everybody turned the other way. Mm -hmm. Late in her life, she gets led to Christ by the people, um, David and Beulah Buckley, who founded the City Union Mission in Kansas City. It's a, you can't believe the story. The story of her conversion would take another 30 minutes, but they lead her to faith in Christ. Annie Chambers gets saved. She turns her brothel into a place for Bible studies. It's true. I've, never, I've never heard it's, the name. I'm going right. to have to go Google now. Yeah, it's true. So she turns her brothel into a place for Bible studies. Several years back, I read an interview that she did with the Kansas City Star before, uh, before she died. And so the Kansas City Star wanted to find out about her conversion. Don't you miss the days when the newspaper wanted to hear about somebody's conversion? So this is 33 or 34. They're interviewing her. At the end of the interview, this, um, this uh, reporter asked her, said, well, what's the one thing you've learned from the Bible more than anything else? And she pointed to a Bible verse she had on the wall. It was framed on the wall. It was Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And she said, the best thing I've learned from the Bible is, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Man, that is a message for Sanctity of Life Month. Um, yes, we're telling you that abortion is not God's will. And we don't want you to abort your children. And we realize some of you have. But here's what we want you to know. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shouldn't be white as snow. That God forgives it. And you can find healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a wonderful, wonderful message. And friends, as you're watching, if you have any questions for Dr. Branch, please send them in. We'll be glad to try to answer those on air real quickly as we wrap up. But I think what you've said is so important. I mean, I think you said it and let in with two ways. Um, it's prevalent. Uh, you told a story of a friend in high school. I have a friend in high school, and she had an abortion, and she went to church every week. Yep. Where did I meet her? I met her on a mission trip.
we went on a mission trip together. Uh, now, I wasn't converted at the time, but I'm on this trip. I meet her. We know each other. And I knew her for several years. She gets an abortion. Um, and it wrecked her life. Yeah. And sent her on a horrific spiral that we reconnected probably two or three years after that. And as we sat there and talked, my heart broke because I had yeah. been converted to Christ at that point. I had become a follower. And as I started talking with her, she, she just told me of of self-loathing. She told me of suicidal attempts and yep. thoughts. Yep. She told me of, of the, the constant struggle she had mentally because of it. And she just detailed then how it went into substance abuse for her. And it just mm. broke my heart because here is a young woman. Substance that, abuse. She's self-medicating. Yeah. Yeah. And she got into other things beyond that as well, just yeah. because dealing with the shame, the frustration, the anger, right. the hurt, the loss. And so what it told me, even as a young follower of Christ, was in the, the churches of Jesus Christ, this has happened to young men and young women, men that have been with women, women who have had this, and they're hurting. And sometimes I think, even like you said from the outset, we haven't set a tone of, yes, this is true, we are very passionately pro-life, but we are pro-life or pro-people. And yeah. so there's sometimes not the avenue or pathway back. And so when you talk about our sins are scarred, they can be as wide as snow. I think that's so important. Like you said, we promote that message, that thought. Well, I hope so. I, I really want to. I, I want people to hear that good news that, man, I, at the end of the day, I teach ethics, but at, I, I still think of myself primarily as a preacher. I'm here to tell people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he came for broken people. And he came for people that have, have made so many tragic and terrible mistakes in life. And if if all of us got up and someone had a video of, of our entire life, we'd all run and hide in shame. Uh, and that's why we, all need the, why we all need the Lord. We all need Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm grateful for what he's done in my life. Uh, Lisa and I have chatted uh, many a times about these, about these issues and about the struggles that people have and about the brokenness that can come from, from bad choices. I, I want to reiterate, Jesus came for broken people. So that's you. That This message is for you. Right. And I think that's a great way to wrap up the interview. If you were going to say something to someone right now who either has experienced abortion, has a family member who has, right. has a partner that they've experienced an abortion together, whether one side wanted or both wanted, that's the message you would send to them. Yeah, I, I would say this. Two things. First of all, yes. As best as I read the scriptures, abortion is a sin. Uh, saying to, uh, the cases where the mother's life is in imminent danger, like an eptocket pregnancy, are different categories. So, but yes, abortion is a sin. But God forgives sin, and Jesus came for you, and there's hope for you, and you can your your life may be in a place right now that you never wanted it to be, but it doesn't have to be that way for the rest of your life. You can be on the road to heaven. You can have a new and a better life today. Eternal life doesn't begin when we die. It begins when we trust Christ. And it's a long road of obedience in the same direction. And the healing that Jesus, there's many of us watching and sitting here can tell, tell you, Jesus Christ brings healing in ways that you would never imagine. And there's all sorts of apologetics I could give for why I believe I'm a Christian. But to a degree, there's an aspect of the Christian life you are never going to understand until you tasted the forgiveness. And like you said, it's not the clearest apologetic, but somebody's rightfully said there's no arguing with the power of a changed no, life. No, there's not. Yeah. That's right. yeah. And so those watching, I want to encourage you with this. Uh, tonight, if you have questions after watching, let us know. We'll be glad to answer those in whatever way we can as a church or Dr. Branch directly. We'll give it as notes to you. And then want to encourage you to join us tomorrow in person or online as we talk about the sanctity of life in the morning and then issues regarding end of life in the evening. Two vital, crucial, important subject matters that I want to say if you're watching right now and you're not a follower of Christ, maybe you've heard about God, maybe this is somehow you stumbled on this, a friend shared it with you, whatever it might be, I'd challenge you, watch tomorrow to hear some perspective maybe that you're familiar with or unfamiliar with. But follower of Christ, I really want to stress to you, tomorrow, two vital subjects for us to be not only aware of, but then be able to articulate to help get the message of hope out to those God has put around us, that we would know how to articulate that and be a help to the community that we find ourselves in and the people that have been stewarded into our sphere of influence. And so, again, join us tomorrow, 1030, 
and 6 o'clock we'll have Dr. Alan Branch with us again. And again, Dr. Branch, thank you for your thank time you. tonight. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow, whether virtually or in person. I hope you have a great evening.